Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. Really well like this. Thanks. Thanks very much for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I think I'm really pleased and privileged to, uh, to be part of uh, this conference, as uh, the model said. Um, and the thing you mentioned about uh, me being a certified wildcat tracker sort of shows that I am trying to be part of the community. Uh, and actually, work with wildcat. Mostly, I have a question that I'm desperate to get to conference. I, my, my talk follows really naturally from uh, yesterday's plenary by Michael uh, Gates. She showed a uh, video in my profile in Europe that had a sentence, let's welcome wildlife back into our landscapes. So that's really what this talk is all be about so, as well. The nice thing about having such a long plenary talk at your disposal is that you can throw in some nice quotes without worrying too much about uh, time. Uh, and here's one by uh, David Thoreau, the uh, 19th century famous author of works like uh, Baldo. And he worried about wildlife that disappears, so he said this in his journal. And when I consider that the nowhere animals have been exterminated here, this is the eastern United States, the cougar, panther, the lynx, the green, the bear, the moose, the deer, the beaver, the turkey, and so forth, the hell of fields, if I live in the same and as it were the masculine of the country, is it not the name of the imperfect nature I am conversing with? Then you compare the nature to a poem that's complete. So I think infinite pains to know all the phenomena of the script, thinking that I have read the entire poem, then to the shepherd to hear that it is but an imperfect copy that I possess and read, that my ancestors tore on many of the first beings in the grandest passages and moved them in many places. I should not like to think that some damnable and fortunate bit might still be the best of the stars. I wish to know the entire heaven, higher earth. This is a reminder to Stone. I can pass it on to uh, this. Uh, I do. I, I just have to pass it around and to try to guess what animal this might be from. We'll come back to that later. And so the, the talk I'm, I'm doing about uh, negative restoration from the little point of view is really part of a bigger story. As, uh, Essentially, all talks at this conference are part of a bigger story, namely uh, the big story that is on the slide uh, that the, the biodiversity crisis that we're in uh, is arguably easy to argue that uh, this is the biggest challenge that we have on our hands at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest story in the world from many perspectives. And the best available science as collected filed by the uh, index um, shows and uh, observably that biodiversity is rapidly declining. Products <coughs> are human made and well known as the most progressive location for climate change basis. Uh, but also that we know how to protect nature. And a word that refers in the work of the best is this transformative change. So that's really what is needed to turn the tide to reverse the virus to um, So business as usual is pretty unfortunate. Uh, sweeping evil things also unfortunately. Transformative radical uh, system change. And key ingredients of, of uh, recommendations in this regard are giving nature much more space. Um, famous half-earth idea by the uh, U.S. biologist Edward Wilson, that if we manage to give nature space, not exclusive space for nature without humans, but space uh, to thrive in half uh, our biomes, then we can save all species in the long term. And this idea of devoting much more of the surface to nature is becoming an increasingly uh, official policy national. So 30% by 2030 is really mainstream 
policy uh, and perhaps more than the state of the that part of the field. But of course, the law of nature is in bad state, so ecosystems must be restored. And indeed, when the General Assembly has declared that the decade where it needs the United Nations decade for ecosystem restoration, specifically, this is really one of the main tasks that we have in this decade as a national Then, of course, the question is restore ecosystems how to what? And on the slide about there is more uh, than recommendations, large urban natural areas connecting with each other. Uh, that's things like origin of natural dynamics by for instance with the dams from the rivers and uh, virtually returning six species. That's what this talk is about. And in particular, it's about megaphones so like other terms like rewilding is also the definition of megaphone. Uh, so, in our research, we look at megafauna mainly as being terrestrial and mammals, biomass uh, potential of mouse, or the general features of the inner stuff. And um, as far as I understand from the ecological literature, by and large, compared to smaller animals, um, the megafauna is important for ecosystems, comparatively important. There are keystone species, as has been mentioned at the times already in this conference. So, the idea that many of these large herbivores are describing those big virtual forms of ecosystems are necessary functional ecosystems. But secondly, uh, compared to smaller animals, compared to the average, the large animals have suffered compared to the losses shown in this uh, picture from the study by the Stewarts showed the natural megafauna of Eurasia uh, and so the black stuff is gone and green stuff remains present. And uh, thirdly, this is a little bit of a system, this is the coexistence many talks of this conference and discussions that were illustrated. Uh, I, I assume that many of you are people that are actual scientists, like me, working with the numbers and uh, stats and things like that, and spreading down in nature. Um, as a lawyer, uh, I'd like to work with theologians and other people. My, my work is text. Texts is what I uh, work with. For numbers that I'm uh, directly. And uh, I really like to read uh, books, uh, some of the books. Uh, slide played a uh, role in uh, giving me the idea to pursue this line of research that I'm talking about today. Uh, and, uh, but of course, my main um, occupation is spending time with legal texts. For instance, uh, this article from the Bird Convention on the Conservation of European Wildlife and National Defense. Uh, obliging parties to the Convention of European Nations to undertake to encourage the reintroduction of native species of modern flora and fauna when this would contribute to the conservation of endangered species. And that term native, among other things, calls for further interpretation. Uh, application to the individual species is the species of native species in the sense of the native or isn't it? How do you determine that? So that's the kind of stuff I usually spend my days on. And um, people have to do that by uh, looking at the text of the convention, obviously, and also looking at uh, texts adopted by parties to the convention uh, later on to uh, clarify certain parts of the convention or determine how particular those forms of the application of the convention issues. Those are all my importance today. Interpret in difference the interpretation of binding conditions. Also, authoritative non binding evaluates provided, for instance, by the IUCN, as is in this case, the evaluates for the introductions, uh, are useful in uh, helping us understand what native means as in terms of the constraints. And then when you look at the concrete species, uh, obviously, you can look at the ecological literature itself to see what's where species occurred in the past. There is uh, 
and so then how do you do the as a class? Uh, about that combining more and closing uh, skills. Another example, convention with biology and diversity, it's going to be the most dominant in the world. I'll sign it to article A and F uh, obliges parties to as far as possible as appropriate, of course, of course, as the woman is just in terms of the fish one, uh, to prohibit it and restore the grading ecosystems from all the property of threatened species. And the convention itself has this definition of ecosystem, dynamic complex, the plant, animal, microorganism communities, they're all environmentally interacting with a functional unit. And the parties have also adopted the same. Decisions, all decisions, all the final decisions on the issue of ecological restoration, which is how to understand the obligation itself. And for example, they expressed this definition of ecological restoration of the process of managing our system in a concrete ecosystem, creating plans for exploiting. Degradation is characterized by the decline of both biodiversity, for ecosystem functions, and degradation of restoration of that specific. Or the state of ecosystem processes. So that will really help us to understand that restoring the great ecosystems has to be able to restore the functions of the ecosystems. And just talk about stretches. And these are other terms that, uh, in this particular public area, we come across all kinds of legal instruments at the national, at national levels. Native, all native, indigenous, indigenous, naturally arranged, natural species composition, original species composition, degraded and all the integrity or dying, restoration. So all of these terms are very individual in the interpretive of uh, scenarios. And for that, of course, lawyers need ecological information. And that's what I'm trying to do with this uh, line of research to do with the help of others, fortunately, including uh, the ecologists themselves. Look at the, 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 the facts about large mammals, their organs, and their system, their significance, possibilities for eternity. And then uh, looking at that from a perspective that I've looked at more. There's a concept of the mission that forgets its past as the future. And it is easy to argue. I think that this also applies to natural history. So, some pictures now of the natural obligatory uh, dose of in the past you would have expected to produce. There are also lots of pleasant uh, pictures. So, this is a, a mosaic made by Roman artists of two uh, native European animals. Those days, which uh, still be found in Europe, a lion predating a monitor, so long. Um, and uh, if we go a little bit further back in time, then this would be uh, a picture that uh, you uh, might have encountered in, in Europe. And uh, I, I like this picture because you can, on the left top, you still see the road here. A familiar animal, which you can if you go for a walk around uh, by and you can spot these animals still. Uh, also, on the right is the Maurus, another calf. Of course, we have the domesticated descendants still from that species, and also the wild domesticated cattle in national areas again. Um, the European water buffalo is, is, is extinct, but as uh, ecological replacement of the species in some fresh natural areas in the Scotland and in Delta, there are the domesticated or domesticated uh, Asian water buffalo, so it's possibly what the extinct species used to do. And then, of course, there's the uh, spray glass elephants, the rhinos, and the hyenas and hippos that are pretty warm from Europe. And then you might think this is pretty long ago, of course, it really isn't. Um, as you know better than I do, it's ecological, geological, evolutionary time scales. Um, where in the last 30 million years, animals, 
that's different by channels around as we go for what uh answer the video that the blinker and I know the terms here, which is why I'm not just going to disappear from much of the globe. And this is a study by the electricity spending and others that show on the right hand side the, the natural situation, no norm that used to apply for millions of years. So on the top right, you see the really heavy burn wars, the heavy wars about the, 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 the thousand kilos. And they're uh, basically in terms of the diversity. As you see that uh, there are really lots of different analysis. So I'll just tell you where the one and the specialist. And then on the left, of course, the current situation where it's possible to be down as a parts of Africa and parts of the South Asia. And then the herbivores from 45 to 1,000 kilos. So, slowly on the right, the natural diversity on the left, the current one. And then the iron ore production numbers. That's the uh, story. And the series of other quotes by Alfred Russell also called the Better Evolutionary Theory, alongside the Darwin, in the 18th century. He observed in writing this that we are now in altogether exceptional period in US history. We have been so logically impoverished the world, which all the hugest and fiercest and strangest of quarrels have recently disappeared. Yet it's surely the marvelous fact is that one that's hardly been sufficiently well solid dying out of soil and much of the day one of the slowly developed strokes of And he already uh, theorized that uh, man must be behind this, and it uh, turns out that he was right to try to understand the logical literature of our lives that um, the disappearance of the megaphone of Roman continents and now it's called size freakishly with the arrival of also what's and uh, that was the story that also better seems to tell time again. So it's not a natural development, it's prevented by natural, but a man-made extension of so it's early days. So this was a thousand or ten thousand years ago, which of course was a big year of course. In this week's paper, uh, food webs have been um, mapped out. So, the relationships between large herbivores and large carnivores in uh, areas where lots of fossils have been found. And on the left, you see the natural uh, food web richness, and on the right, the current one. Uh, in this case, for uh, the south of Nordea, California. And then we know that the plus so fast that we have just traced one of paintings. And with all their stolen school webs that have now depauperate. And there are lots of fantastic illustrations of this study as well, um, showing in this case for uh, Adea that um, if you see the, the animals in color, the megaphone can still find around those areas. And so the, the gray ghost species are the ones that they should have been there, but are no longer there. And Paul Martin, uh, biologists uh, who look into this uh, issue uh, a lot, uh, had this observation. It's important in America, I think, most of the rest of the world is probably curious for the species and for species of mammals. Brown skulls, the big girl, the giant armadillos, giant beavers, giant monkeys, stand on most of the world's brush Austin, woodland musk Austin, native camels and horses. Short faced bears, dire wolves, silver teeth, and dirt teeth, cats, and American subspecies of the lion. And the survivors, he says, of the big white ones, are those large animals to be able to use now. There's bison, there are bears, there are cougars, deer, milk, there's muscles, and frogs. Frogs. Most people regard these as defining wild America. They do not, as it says. To give so little attention to the dozens of big animals. So recently, the city is also short. The poor extension of our native food mammals in the world are much more important than they are the cost of this realize. And so, for all, uh, how we did realize how incomplete that poem that we talked about <coughs> was. 
And this is a situation of the situation in Europe, so many areas in Northwest Europe. And this is the megafauna which you would typically encounter, um, as opposed to the megafauna that you would encounter at the long drawn foot of the mountain today. And with the uh, homestead that's coming to here, which looks like this. And um, yeah, all those, uh, these books. Uh, put it nicely, uh, lost lines, other cultures can do this, as we're all walking in the world of shadows, but we have a ghost in the And if we're all the old ones who study in the shadow, then in front of her, what wants to ask me to do again? Okay. This is another observation that's stuck with me. A uh, natural state of the world, the uh, island of Persia, the area, the state of the heart of Australia. That's a hard thing to realize. I think it's hard to start to start to start. Um, then the question, of course, is yeah, is that just a uh, nostalgic uh, romantic uh, thoughts about uh, this past that is, of course, impossible to recreate? Um, to some extent, perhaps, uh, obviously, turning back to the logic of law is not an option we have. Some of these species are going extinct. There was uh, quite a bit more people on the planet. There was a place of species that propagated the planet uh, for a relatively long time. So, now we can go back to the extension of picture. Uh, but what is striking and possible is to adopt uh, sort of the natural situations, which is some various illustrations of. As the golden standard, the model to be approached as far as possible, step by step, uh, sort of gold standard to strive for uh, at uh, the speed that uh, is determined by stability and appropriateness in particular locations. A bit similar to uh, rivers, uh, obstructions in rivers, um, it is not possible at the moment uh, or desirable. To relieve all dams from all rivers for all parts. Uh, but it's at the same time obvious that the gold standard is completely for the following years. And so, megafauna restoration is something that is uh, argued for by many, including uh, Christian Svenning, who says that uh, yeah, the wild with the megafauna in its days only <laughs> had an effective role in the lakes, regenerating and maintaining biodiversity. And so I am interested in the role of development policy in that regard. And there are quite a few illustrations in the literature showing that development restoration can work. It's a good effect indeed, not only for the species themselves, which recover the population, but also for the ecosystem at large. This study shows for. Uh, Abandoned uh, military area in the Czech Republic, that uh, the bison and the uh, wild cats and the wild horses uh, had their own area. After seven years, there were increases in species richness, functional diversity, proportion of flower and forbs, and the abundance of animals to pass out of the area. Of course, one of them over there is for free. So, uh, I'm not sure where the component is. Uh, Everybody has seen it. Uh, so, any guesses? I'm still, still living around. But uh, those of you who have seen it, I found it on the Dutch beach. That's the mass flood uh, area, uh, which is where uh, the Dutch port of Rotterdam is enlarged uh, by uh, a lot of sand. That been scooped up from the North Sea floor and down there is built uh, a lot of islands. And uh, there's a few beaches there, and if you walk there and pay attention, it's really easy to find uh, uh, nice things such as this. Then you can send them to a uh, website. There are experts on the map around this group that tells you uh, if they know what you found. So that's how I know that it exists. Um, nice. Our dog did it, no. Oh, there is a lot of smells. It's fine. 
it's um, I was told that this is a humerus of a uh, woolly rhinoceros. Used to call the Netherlands home. So, just by way of demonstration, that this is actually real and tangible stuff that we're talking about. And so, one thing I did was uh, we asked the people who actually know about the sticks, in this case, the Mr. Still Senate of Iris University, if he could come up with a list of uh, European megafauna, so species from that development out that would be more likely to have lived in Europe today. Have and not particularly in the past, but there are certain four species. And um, over half of those are about 39 of those per head present in Europe, so that's really a lot. Then the bigger species have suffered the biggest losses, so above 100 kilos, the worst 35 species, 27 of those are gone. And obviously, the really heavy ones, the uh, uh, green mouth, the stress elements, and various random species, and others. And of course, many surviving species remain under the restricted distribution of abundance, as we think that has uh, illustrated uh, yesterday morning. So, in uh, the paper, I'll show you some things later on if you're interested. Um, you can find uh, this table. This is the first uh, third, so going from the white species to the east. You see that the uh, Right column, second mark of the bottom the right. A lot of these species are still present in small southern areas. And the final group is running to the Ural Mountains and the Caucasus. And this is the middle section. You see that there's lots of more gaps than many. The column is the presence in the bottom. And uh, when we start then we start to see the part of any particular name. And of course, in theory, so all this is happening in practice, uh, there are different ways in which these species can or could be restored. Or could be attempted to be restored. Some of this is, uh, is happening, such as the National Review of Social Rules, the International Council, and so on. Um, and then uh, the Alrox as well, it's for the Alroxes. Those uh, domesticated descendants are finding their way back into natural areas. And then for some other species, uh, ecological replacement is the only option. There are no domesticated descendants of the globally extinct species, and neither in this uh, just a pretty fast of the extinction scenarios, uh, genetic engineering, um, or uh, finding proxy species that might work in the same function of the ecosystem as the missing species would. And obviously, there's a lot of experience as well as illustrated as well as the uh, with uh, reintroduction to the ebrace, with the bison, for instance, also with the rewilding of the And quite a bit more groundwork is, is uh, probably needed for reintroductions of species that are probably not important and survive elsewhere, species, such as moon bears. This illustration is quite a few more of those that still exist in Asia or Africa that would flourish in the European native species. Um, and the uh, same is true of bringing uh, about the ecological replacement, for instance, uh, the use of Asian Americans, because uh, I think we would have what it looked like they would probably occur if ever in the world, but in biology it's carefully monitored. Small areas and the four kinds of safeguards in place to avoid the unintended consequences. Now, the rule of law in all of this can simply go be negative or still, more than uh, uh, create obstacles to scenarios like this. And uh, let's see some examples of those. And of course, law can also be a positive role by promoting the foreign restoration efforts or by requiring. More. That's what uh, these publications uh, reflect on. And then uh, the syndrome that you have to mention in this context is the shifting baseline syndrome. So, the idea that uh, people tend to <laughs> think of nature in terms of nature rather than unconsciously, 
uh, that as to more of what nature should be and during their lifetime, perhaps worry about the kinds of stuff that they don't know when they're young. They're not really thinking about all the damage that their ancestors, generation after generation, who they never think the new system is around. And uh, as Chris Thomas writing notes, uh, the rest of the Europeans are generally the Indians, the absence of writers and writers of the Indians don't really listen. And predictably, those shifted baselines have become reflected in law and policy. Because law and policy just reflects what uh, society at large feels. And that's something we have reflected on the newspaper. So, for instance, the lion, which we speak in, would be a native European species, um, doesn't occur in lists of native indigenous European species, but European instruments or national. Uh, the instruments, policy instruments uh, around the world. If you would want to reintroduce the line, you probably run legislation saying that that's an estimated species with a permit and a validity because this is uh, not an native European species. Uh, same with the, the, the cattle of the horses that have uh, lived now uh, in many human, many natural areas for a long time. They are still for the law. By and large, uh, classified as livestock, subject to all kinds of agricultural and agricultural legislation, culture, because we want species, what you was And so there's an endless list of new forms developing questions where probably people actually work with, for instance, uh, this uh, revival of the cattle and horses, they have uh, a whole list of. And um, obstacles and irritations about the requirements that apply to these animals and after the death of their work. It's just the status of the horses and cattle, but also European bison, which is subject to uh, European health standards for livestock as well. Um, the inability to do carcasses, but to do new carcasses in the wild, it's not a sexual element, it's not a circle of life. Uh, liability issues when um, tourists listed by salt picture in one of the sessions. Uh, tourists uh, should take a selfie spin, selfie in large and great in the course. Then maybe the tourist appreciate the selfie so much. That's this, uh, no, it shows it, but it's related to the, the, the person who has the jersey for the reliability issues for area managers or bird managers. Uh, the picture is, of course, this uh, crossing back and forth between uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, from one set of veterinary police to the other, and, and so on. But there are also obligations to restore uh, that are really relevant for negative illustrations of the history of this paper, was to do with the National Biodiversity, the Urban Convention. But basically, the biodiversity protocol asks parties to develop and put policies and strategies in its territory, aiming at the conservation, restoration, and sustainable survivors of the Indians. Uh, and that restoration is defined as the return of the ecosystem. Its original structure, natural composition of species, and natural functions. And uh, the parties themselves have also now a strong commitments from this issue to achieve transformative ecosystem restoration. So it then becomes quite easy to argue that not only uh, returning European bison is part of uh, implementing this obligation. Uh, it's also complicated the introductions of the humans, which were in the committee before uh, efforts were with humans before. So, if you're talking about the natural composition of species, this is something for serious to address in terms of the implementation. And the same is true with conventional biological diversity. And as we uh, concluded after a long analysis of this provision, in light. Of Decisions, international guidance documents 
and the logic was prohibited for sure. Uh, this obligation actually requires the store of the first two densities of the universe made of one as far as possible, which is quite like far. Then we'll think about how it's possible, but as far as possible. That term was included in the convention to indicate that uh, in developing countries, less is possible, so less is expected from developing countries, and more is expected from rich countries. And so the countries that the India shown here, and the picture shows how long is in fact possible. Now, the law obviously plays different roles depending on the circumstances. So, all of these scenarios, the law plays a role, sometimes a really crucial one. So, uh, in the example of the wolves, the girls, the discussed about the wedding, and the conference, and uh, the law in particular, the strict protected status of the wolves in the law has played a really decisive role. Sweden, and Germany, and France, and now also the Netherlands. Because there was a really question of do we want wolves? That was already decided that we would be involved. And then there was an international open discussion in the Netherlands about do we as a society have a consensus that we want wolves back? I don't think we would need them, just as they are in the UK, and will not be for the rest of the future state. So, and, and the law plays the role in all these other scenarios that we discuss in these two papers. Uh, just to give one uh, example, the uh, Habitats Directive on the European legislation uh, requires EU member states to designate protected areas, so 200,000 sites for species like the European bison, the beaver, animals, uh, and bears. And a new proposal by the European Commission is also extremely relevant in this context uh, as it includes really specific targets on the uh, recovery of ecosystems for animal type species with the percentages and deadlines involved. It's now in the legislative pipeline that perhaps can be ever stopped for now. And this will be binding law as well. And complying with the obligation under the Convention on Biological Diversity requires addressing the obstacles of national law, such as, for instance, uh, rules that uh, require you to remove carcasses of uh, large game forests that they are capital of horses out of these natural areas. Now, clearly, some of the scenarios uh, touched on above are controversial. And um, George Longley, who did nicely and Bill Farrell, will be observing that, if I recall correctly, um, the clamor for the Lions to introduction to the UK is currently muted. Um, so, like the filter on the term, I assume that he might say less than likely. And of course, there are reasons for that because living with these animals. Is an easy task again. This conference is all about um, so the people who live with lions and elephants uh, will tell you that this is not easy. And I do want to um, just look at some species that nevertheless uh, are still present in India. It's really um, instructive to compare the uh, not only the difference in wealth. But also population density. So Europe has uh, 34 million per square mile. India has 460. Uh, but still, uh, India's human population of 1.4 billion in Europe somehow still share the landscape with American elephants, rhinos, and galleries. There are multiple problems. In 20 species of deer and antelope, wild boar, Great monkeys, as well as the tigers, lions, leopards, snow leopards, caracals, brown bears, moon bears, snow bears, sun bears, striped hyenas, wolves, golden jackets, and lions. Of course, now there is more than one. And the introduction of the year is because of the challenge of the ecosystem of the 
which you expect it to triple by the end of this uh, century. And that leads me finally to a what I believe is a strong model. It's the low law, which is tied to this pledge uh, that the parties go around the world to suffer to the real education. They shall cooperate in the spirit of global partnership to restore the health of the numerous ecosystem. Of course, if we say we're going to restore NFR to uh, really recent baselines, then all the work that we more than five uh, index progressed countries is actually because that's where most NFR gains or, or was around uh, recently. So that would be incredibly unfair as this paper by the second master of the still settings shows it very clearly. And um, Tim Flannery has put it nicely in this book. He says, um, I think the moral case is unassailable. It's unacceptable to ask the people of Africa, which population they each have to live in the country, to live alongside the country. That's what he was about. And, and there's been some of the funny growing moment of discussions about these issues. So on the one hand, most people here in Europe, for instance, uh, are not advocating to people in, let's say, Tanzania to get rid of what they're lions and elephants and the problems where we need to grow it out and so on. Quite the opposite. Most of us want those animals to stay around in mean, countries like Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Botswana. Uh, in the uh, at the same time, if you suggest what like I'm doing here, that perhaps we should seriously think about reintroducing some of the animals in the future in some stage of Europe, people want to keep their heads and say, we're out of our minds. That's a ridiculous notion. So, and of course, it's a bit problematic to say, well, uh, lions and Tanzanians, please, uh, Europe, now it's ridiculous. It's like, uh, Claiming that we have privileges that they don't, uh, that we deserve privileges that they don't deserve. That's, of course, somebody, something that nobody wants to uh, sign up to or say this like that. So I think that that's an argument that at least Mary's thinking about uh, carefully and also puts in perspective the current debates on uh, the. Uh, the return of wolves to countries like the Netherlands. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to end like uh, Raquel, and we're just saying that's welcome wildlife back to our landscapes. Uh, and I look forward to the uh, discussion if anybody is uh, up to it. All I've uh, done is, um, yeah, uh, portray the research we've been doing, maybe some questions that I think merit serious discussion. To uh, enter into such discussions. So, for it, also, I think there are really uh, interesting and promising lines of research uh, into all kinds of concrete scenarios uh, for <laughs> legal and ecological cooperation. So, uh, to be continued, and for now, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the questions you may have. So we have 10 minutes for questions, but Ari will stay around. So for further questions, we will be available. Ari, would you be so kind to briefly summarize the question so other people in the room can hear what the question is? Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So the question is about this new uh, this proposed uh, regulation of the nature investigation, project investigation, and what the relevance of the current proposal is to the South. 
and um, I see both uh, opportunities and limitations. So opportunities in the sense that um, a lot of the mega fauna uh, is on the list of habitats that I do. So the species that are still present in the European Union, such as bison and wolf and so on. And for those species, uh, the, uh, the regulation will include uh, strong obligations to return those species to a favorable conservation status uh, by a certain point in time. Um, in terms of limitations, uh, lions are not uh, on the list of habitats I mentioned. Mean. And so, uh, species that are not currently in the building are not on the radar of this proposal. Um, so I think that's an opportunity that remains to be slow because if the purpose is to uh, restore ecosystems, then uh, arguably there are uh, missing species that are currently in the first place. Yes. Because we have the native plants and species that we have to do in conservation, so we can just recognize in the southern and the definition of native or related or native. But if you want to start from later on, we can look at the yeah. Yes, thanks a lot. So, the question is about uh, invasive alien species legislation, particularly the uh, EU regulation on invasive alien species in the EU, sorry. Um, so, uh, in general terms, uh, yes, it is certainly true that investigating species legislation can provide a hurdle, especially if we're not about the ecological replacement. So introduce the species from uh, Asia or Africa uh, to uh, take the place of extinct uh, European ones. Uh, so take the example of the uh, Asian elephant. Uh, some pilot project is proposed and the permits for that and they run into this uh, legislation. Um, the, the EU regulation itself is then an upper problem because it only applies to uh, species that are on the list of, of uh, species of the EU concern, which is quite a short list of Asian elephants on that list. Uh, but in terms of national legislation, it is definitely the EU issue. And in that sense, it's interesting that uh, the international flora, including the biodiversity convention and the Berlin convention, uh, the parties to those conventions have adopted. Um, recommendations, decisions saying that uh, ecological replacements and system organization operations must be seriously considered uh, for various reasons, including climate, climate change. Uh, but it really would at least on the table as valid options. Uh, of course, the same price uh, making a few of research to make sure that um, unintended consequences uh, will be very unlikely, but we can tell the price. But uh, I don't think that the investor species legislation, taken as a whole, poses uh, insurmountable obstacles at this stage. It's all about the um, factual uh, motivation of the I know there are some simple frustrations because of the reason to the words and also not as sensitive to it. So now, I mean, that goes to the student who is in the same plot and it is not there. But it all relates, I think, to the uh, as far as possible uh, as such that we. And I saw the picture of those uh, Indian people, 
Then we strongly felt um probably the the experience would happen in time And that takes us to this notion of how much likelihood we see about so in the Western hemisphere and human lives, I think of more precious than they are in sun. So that we cannot um currently sustain the perception of danger that is made upon the most one activities while we assume that the very sun is a negligible and unacceptable part. Excellent. Uh, uh, very difficult to do in the summer. <laughs> uh, it, it's about um, yeah, the question whether security risks associated with uh, these animals and the costs to livelihoods associated with dangerous uh, yes. artifacts. I think for us, it would be unbearable to receive the case, but we, we want you know, the people who are in this country to do for us is to do more of them. Um, provide financial support for the projects to conserve its yeah, so you put your finger on, on something very sensitive, obviously. Uh, and so, just for this, the double standards that we mostly unconsciously, I suppose, uh, have. Uh, as I said, in the examples, uh, yeah, it's uniformly as northern societies, we tend to sort of take for granted that in countries with global south capabilities and on uh, we be able to very much appreciate that. Continuing to do so, and um, that's why I don't have stuff necessarily to, to think seriously about such options. Um, yeah, it, so I, I I just agree that these are really tricky uh, things, and that it is important to, to look at the big picture, as I try to do, um, as uh, Sophie uh, has helped and Dan's Christina have done. Um, and to look at uh, what, is, what is fair and what is just, and of course, in terms of, of uh, concrete implementation, uh, wherever uh, it's obviously necessary and appropriate to do this in a way as this conference is constantly illustrating, that is, um, yeah, as it has respect for the, the case itself, the history of the case, the views of the public, and so on. Um, I'm not sure that. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it's yeah, it's 10 o'clock. So uh, I think the coffee is already four minutes, so we should go. Um there is time for our coffee. Thank you. Okay, coffee. <laughs>